Hello and welcome to this latest edition of Bulls on Parade Talk. I am your host, Joshua Sines. I've been away for a while, but I'm back and have a few things on my mind I need to discuss. And these are the these are the last couple of things that have occurred within the organization, Houston Texans organization, that is, that have really have created a lot of questioning from a lot of people, including people on the radio and and just in the media in general. So, number one, um, I got a couple things right here I need to discuss with you guys. So, first of all, the latest news, well, I wouldn't say latest, this happened about a, little, a couple days ago, actually, um, is that now that the East-West Shrine game is done, now that he has completed his East-West Shrine, Shrine game duties, he, Mr. Romeo Cornell, that's right, Romeo Cornell, has agreed to a three-year deal to become the new defensive coordinator for the Houston Texans. So what's the first thing? So my immediate reaction is, hmm, Romeo Cornell, he's the guy that helped the Patriots defense when they won three Super Bowls. And, you know, the word around the NFL about Romeo Cornell is he, he and, I, and, and this is, this is, this is a quote, you know, he's recognized by a lot of peers and a lot of, a lot of aficionados as to be one of the best defensive coordinators in league history. Now, I don't know much about him, but the thing is, you know, you have to wonder, you know, he runs a, he he runs a three four defense himself, but there's one thing that just really gets me curious. And this question has been asked, you know, a lot of people because you know, um, Wade Phillips ran a th an attacking three four scheme, which basically involves a lot of a lot of a lot of aggressive a lot of aggression from the front four from the front three, and it re really specializing with putting a lot of attention on the, on the defensive tackle. And so and when you got a guy like JJ1 on the front line, you got to you got to you got to be excited about having that kind of a system and it worked for a while. You know, and Wade Phillips is not a bad coach. I really like Wade Phillips. But you know, over over time, you know, he just we weren't able to adjust to to the um, to better teams. But that's another issue. But the, the, but the reason I bring up Wade Phillips and his way of doing things defensively is because, you know, a lot of people are saying that Romeo Cornell is just another Wade Phillips. Now, like I said, I have to go back and look and see how the Patriots um, played, de or how the, how the defenses under Romeo Cornell played. But just remember this. When Romeo Cornell was a defensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs, that's the la that's the first time I remember seeing him notice at being recognized before you know since the Patriots. But you know Romeo Cornell, he helped groom some pretty good players in Kansas City, and look what they're doing right now. You know those guys are you know Kansas City's defense. They got some players. The season before this one. A couple of those defenders made the Pro Bowl. Just something to keep in mind. And also keep in mind this. Romeo Cornell... Romeo Cornell, in his time at, at, uh, it, with New England, um, he ha he, in three of his four stints as a defensive coordinator, Patriots defense ranked in the top ten. Now, consider the kind of people that he had on his defense. You know, a guy like Richard Seymour, Teddy Bruschi, and Asante Samuel. You know, back now. Consider this is this is like back when he was the defensive coordinator for the Patriots. So I'm not talking about right now. I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about when he coached the when he was a coach for the Patriots. And another thing that, that another thing that is really nice. You know, the Texans got a new linebackers coach, um, Mike Rebell. It's nice because you know Romeo Cornell coached him. He, uh, Mike Ravel, Mike Vrabel was a linebacker with the, for the Patriots under Romeo Cornell's tenure as defensive coordinator. So that'd be kind of cool. So there's familiarity there. 
So Mike Rebell has an idea of what uh, of what uh, Romeo Cornell likes to do. So and um, at the se at a senior bowl practice, you know, the minute the minute that the, the news broke out that Romeo Cornell accepted the accept agreed to to become the defensive coordinator for the Texans, you know, a lot of media people. A lot of and just a lot of people in general were just ran up to R Romeo Cornell at a Senior Bowl practice during the North practice, North teams Senior Bowl practice. You know the Senior Bowl is happening right now, so I'm sure he's taken some time to. He he and Bill O'Brien are probably there right now. You know, watching over potential quarterbacks, potential players. You know, I'm sure that they are there right now scouting. Scouting the young, young, young up-and-coming college players that are going to enter the draft, enter the NFL, mind you. And he was asked, you know, what are you going to do? What kind of defense are you going to run? Well, he at the Senior Bowl, at the practice, he's been quoted by saying this. He said, "Quote: We're going to run a multiple defense. What does that mean? Multiple defense basically means you're going to run different fronts based on situations. So." One in one situation, you might look have a three four look. A three four look when you step to the line of scrimmage. Another time, it might be a four three. It depends on the fronts. It depends on situations. It depends on adjustments. And that's what I'm encouraged. And that's what encourages me. Why am why what encourages me to feel more optimistic? Here's why. Because you know, the biggest problem I believe that the Houston Texans defense, or just the Texans in general, I should say, had last season was adjustments. You know, um, defense could not really pick up what the offensive player, offense was, was doing, really. You know, when they were running, we couldn't really stop them. And then at time, when they started running, you know, we switched. You know, it was, it was all over the place. And... Once in a while, we got to play right, and J.J. Watt got a big, got, got made a big play, you know, as the playmaker that he is. But, you know, the one thing that I heard a lot of people say about the Texans is our unwillingness to adjust week to week. Like, it was the same thing. It was the same game plan every single, every single game. And you know I'm 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 a believer of this of the, of the saying if it's not broke don't fix it, but the thing is it was broke. The system that Gary Kubiak run well I'll have to admit it, the system that we ran was a bit uh, is a bit outdated. You know it's Mike Shanahan's think about it it's Mike Shanahan's system, and you know a lot of people including um, ESPN analyst Stephen A. Smith said that Mike Shanahan's outdated. So the fact that we were that that we didn't that it was the same thing over and over again, and not to mention the fact that you know injuries didn't help us either. You know, well, our best running back got hurt. You know, it was very tough to lean on the running game. So you had to put it all into the hands of first year starter Case Keenum, and over time he did some good things. You know, Ben Tate was running like. He, like, he, like he had a chip on his shoulder. So Dennis Johnson himself, when he got some time, he had some pretty good plays himself. Still, though, it was very discouraging to a lot of fans that I have listened to, that I have heard, and I have read, that the Texans were unwilling to adjust. To adjust their game plan. Week to week, and in-game as well. In-game as well was where, where it really was... Um, was noticeable. So with Romeo Cornell coming in, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the Romeo Cornell story alone by simply saying this: Romeo Cornell is very highly respected as a defensive mind by a lot of people. But you know, the fact that I'm hearing people say, "Oh, he's just another Wade Phillips." I would say give him a chance. You know, don't even he's he's got the he's he's he just got ex, he just agreed to the deal. This is going to be his first stint with um under Bill O'Brien's staff. So 
just get, let's let's see what happens in his first year. And if it ends up that he um, is just like Wade Phillips, then I'll say okay. Then that's when I'll say it. But I don't know. Like I said, I have to go back and watch his defenses perform. I'm sure that film is out there somewhere, and I can go and I can go find it. I just need to see what happens, especially with the talent that we have now. Considering we're still going to have to make some moves in in the off season, because you know our cap situation is not uh, it's not the best. You know, we I. The last I heard, I, the last I heard, I think, um, I believe we have a little over three million in in cap room. I believe that's what I believe that's what I heard. I've I've heard um, another report saying one point five million. I had another report that said three point one million. I'm trying to find, trying to compare notes, but uh, if anybody knows more about the cap situation, feel free to feel free to comment on this video for those that are watching on YouTube. So anyway, um, so our defensive coordinator position is, has, is officially filled up, and we are just continuing to um, to fill in the staff. So now that we have a defensive coordinator, we still have to, you know, the question now becomes, we need an offensive coordinator. But then um, Bill O'Brien, in a statement, but then Bill O'Brien, in the statement that um, that he gave to um, at the, at the Senior Bowl, actually, at the Senior Bowl, he 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 made it very clear that he's going to be the one calling the plays. And Brian T. Smith, the uh, writer for the Houston Chronicle, posted that on his Twitter as well. On, on his Twitter on January twenty first, he said, "Quote." O'Brien said he'll call plays for Texas, so position will likely go unfilled. So, I was surprised. You know, I actually thought that uh, Bill O'Brien would actually hire someone that he knows and trusts that would um, come and install and call plays on game day. But now, but now at the Senior Bowl, he's saying that, hey, I'm going to do it. So, Right away, that tells me, wait a minute. I gotta be honest. I'm a little worried. I'm a little concerned about that. Although that there are coaches in the NFL right now, um, and even new, and I've I've seen you know with all these new hires that have been going on around the NFL, you know, um, there are coaches that are head coaches now that do call plays, whether it's offense or defense. But I'm seeing the trend. But the trend is becoming a lot more popular. And, I'll, and I got a couple names down here that I can share with you guys. You know, um, a couple NFL head coaches in the NFL are going to be calling plays. I'm going to give you guys a couple names. Uh, Bruce Arians with the Cardinals calls offensive plays. Jay Gruden. Head coach for the Redskins, he's gonna call the plays. Chip Kelly, of course, we know what kind of what kind of offensive mind he is for the Philadelphia Eagles. He's been the one calling the plays. Mike McCarthy for the Packers, he's calling the plays offensively. Bill O'Brien is gonna call plays. Sean Payton, we know what kind of play caller he is for the New Orleans Saints with Drew Brees as the quarterback. He's calling the offensive plays. Andy Reid is an offensive mind himself for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's calling the plays. Rex Ryan, you know, a lot of people rave about Rex Ryan as a defensive genius. He's the one calling the, de the defensive plays. You know, Mark Tressman for the Chicago Bears in his first year as head coach, he's calling the plays. And then finally, Ken Wisenhunt, the new head coach for the Tennessee Titans, he's going to be with the one calling the plays. And then, you know, with the latest hire, the, la the last two names I have down here are Jim Caldwell and Mike Zimmer. You know, and uh, those could be potential. Those two could possibly be, be added to this list as well. But we don't. We still don't know how the rest of their staff is going to look. So that's the only thing that. Um, that's the only thing that that why I ha I didn't name these two like right away. You know, because we don't know how they're going to look. But all, all the rest of these guys, they've already made it. They've already made it clear, or they already have somebody. You know. So, I look at all this. 
So in terms of the offensive coordinator position in, in Houston, you know, for years, think about this. Some people, some people always, some people have always um, have almost, uh, dare I say, cruci have crucified or have high, have criticized Gary Kubiak's play call, his conservative play call. And I will admit, to an extent, it has been conservative. But guess what? Bill O'Brien, as offensive coordinator, he has experience calling plays. You know, he called plays before he was the offensive coordinator for the Patriots in, in I believe, 2010. You know, the Patriots in 2010, they didn't have an offensive coordinator. Bill O'Brien was the one calling the plays. And that same year, they didn't have a defensive coordinator either. So Bill Belichick was the one calling the plays during that season. You know, so with Bill O'Brien now officially stating that he's going to call the plays, a lot of people are saying, wait a minute. What does that leave then? Would it be, is it a, then if we did bring in an offensive coordinator, what would he do? Well, I would lean back to um, what Gary, why Gary Kubiak brought on Rick Denniston. You know, um, a coordinator could be like a a guy that you could brainstorm with. Some of the talk, some of the talk things over to possibly install plays, um, practice plays, and game plan for the for for game game to game, week to week. You know. It's like a brain, like a like a like a guy that you can actually share ideas with and actually get ideas from, or 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 another reason perhaps say is to um, land a possible assistant that they all that they like. You know, Bill O'Brien could actually go out there and hire a good friend of his, a colleague of his that he knows and respects very well as an offensive mind to come on and help him. With the installation, with the game, with the with the play calling, and all that, and all that good stuff, and that's basically what Rick Dennison did under Gary Kubiak. You know, Gary Kubiak called the plays offense for for the offense. Rick Rick Dennison was the offensive coordinator. All he was was a brainstorm, a fellow brainstormer, as as um, as as is basically being said. So, and according to what I'm seeing, what I've read, and what I've seen, Rick Dennison was an old friend of Gary Kubiak's, and he trusted, and they they always shared ideas about the offense. So, and you know, when Gary Kubiak got fired, Rick Dennison took over the play calling, and we all saw what happened. So that's which is which is exactly why I would assume that uh, Rick Dennison was released. So, like I said, um, the position of offensive coordinator is most likely to go uh, unfilled, which is fine. But the thing is, on a personal one, I worry because, you know, the last time, because being a head coach is in the NFL especially is very stressful. You're dealing with a lot of things as the head coach. And then on top of that, you add on the responsibility of, of, of calling the plays and possibly installing the plays and practicing the plays, working with the offense, and grooming your quarterback, that's quite a bit of pressure. You know, because if, if it fails, everything, not only the, not only the, the not only the, um, not just the fact that the, the entire team is not succeeding, but just the fact that your focus is the offense and your offense is, isn't succeeding. If the offense doesn't succeed, it's going to go on his shoulders. And imagine that kind of added weight on his shoulders aside from the aside from the weight of being a head coach. Now, um, like I said, I only have to go what I'm what I now I, I'm only going by what I've seen and what I'm reading from results wise. You know, offensive mind, he knows what he wants. I would he knows what he wants. He's gathering. Bob McNair has been on record saying that he approves. He's really happy with the staff that Bill O'Brien is putting together. And um, so we'll see what happens with him. Like I said, I'm not going to go in too deep with him because I have no idea what's going to happen with him. So um, we'll see. 
So with um with that in, with that in mind with uh w with that in mind about Bill O'Brien calling the plays the question that comes up which is an article that I read on stateofthetexans.com is could the Texans offense mirror the pa the Patriots? And you know I looked at that really quick and I did some notes and the article that I read here does a lot of help with that too. Provides a lot of, a lot of help and 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 research with that. You know, I look at how the Patriots out on the under Tom Brady with Tom Brady as the quarterback, how they've run their offense. And the one thing I learned and, and I've learned and I and they and they point out a couple of interesting points about the kind of offensive system that New England runs. And I'm exp and I'm, I'm going to break it down to you really quick from the article that's right in front of me. You know, um the offense, they focus on four main things, and I'll go and I'll go and I'll go by them one by one. Number one is pace. They either go up tempo or they slow it down. But and I, I say they do them both. Why? They always change the pace in the middle of the game to almost keep the defense off balance. I like that. It keeps the defense thinking, okay, what are they gonna do? Should we do this? Should we do that? Almost makes them guess. Almost makes them have to have to hesitate. You know what they're gonna call. You know, I'm always a fan of up tempo offenses. I I I as a Houston Cougar, have been watching the up tempo offense. You know, since I from when I got to college. So, um, pace is always good. Always uh, with having the ability to dictate the pace and to and to change it between the games. Go fast or slow or or go really slow. Go really slow and steady to win the race. It's 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 it. You adjust to it, and and you have to. And the defense is forced to adjust to it. Basically, we're dictating our will on their defense, and that's what I like. I like that. Number two, it's flex. They 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 they, they use the word flexible, and the reason they and, and they point out this point. Um, the offense is able to spread you out defensively, or make you um, or play power football, power run. When necessary, you know. In other words, we are able to the the offense is able to hit the defense where at its weak spot. So if it can't defend the pass well, we're gonna throw it all over the. We're gonna make you. We're gonna make you. We're gonna make you defend sideline to sideline, and have you defend the pass, and have and have your secondary, and have and have have your secondary win the battle. Or if they're not good, or if the defense is not good at stopping the run, you got a guy like Arian Foster in the backfield. Give him the football. Give Arian Foster the football. Now, the one thing I worry about power about power play, you know, we're, we, for for years we've been for a couple for the for the last few years we've been a zone running team. The offensive line is very undersized. I don't know how well we would go from a zone blocking scheme to a man scheme. Like I've, I've, I've and I've already gone into details about that in the previous in the previous video. But like I said, we'll see what Bill O'Brien decides to do as he as he and Rick Smith and the offensive staff looks at the Houston Texans. Like I said, but but with the with the idea of the offense being um, flexible, makes you wonder. Hmm, maybe this is ma makes you feel pretty good about it, about it. If considering Bill O'Brien is going to install this kind of offense, and you know, and so that leads to my thir to the third point. They're adaptable. Now, you might think adaptable and flexible are the same points. They're not. I'll explain. They say adaptable as to conditions on the field and personnel on the team. So basically, you're putting your players in the best position to succeed. So I say, so I say we're gonna put our best play. We're gonna we're gonna give our players a chance to do a chance to do damage. So you can bet Andre Johnson is gonna see the ball quite a bit. That doesn't surprise me. But you know we also have a very capable second, second receiver in DeAndre Hopkins. You know, 
He led all rookies last year with, a, with 833 yards receiving second among rookies. He is a legitimate second receiver. Give him and Andre, you know, let him defend both of them. Make him defend both and have the tight ends, And which is, a, which is another point. Which is another point, you know. F for the last two years before this whole situation with Aaron Hernandez came about and Rob Gronkowski, you know, suddenly becoming um, unreliable health-wise, they were in a two-tight end system. Bill O'Brien was off the court here. When they went to the Super Bowl against the New York Giants the second time. And, you know, they ran two tight ends and it worked. Now, consider they didn't have a lot of depth at the wide receiver position. They had Chad Ochocinco, but, you know, he really didn't grasp the offense, the offense very well. It, was, it, just, it didn't really fit him. You know, so, but the point is. You put your best players in a chance to succeed. So, and Garrett Graham is a very Garrett Graham, Ryan Griffin, Owen Daniels. Um, if we keep Owen Daniels, we'll see what happens with him. But those three are very capable tight ends. Now we may target another one in free agency, or we may get one in the draft. I don't know. We'll see what happens, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll address that on another day. But you know. Give Arian Foster the ball 20-plus times. Give Andre Johnson multiple touches. Let um, DeAndre Hopkins or, or Keyshawn Martin on the, give, it, give it to them on, the, on an end around or a jet sweep or something. You know, all kinds of possibilities. And with the right quarterback, who knows? And we'll see how that situation plays out in the draft and free agency and training camp offseason and all, all, that, all that good jazz. So, and the fourth point is pretty self-explanatory. is prepare. Basically, going to be preparing every game, every week, what the defense is going to do most of the time. So we're gonna, we're always gonna, have, they're the, they're they are always gonna enter the game having an idea of how the defense is going to try is going to try to attack the offense to defend against it. Excuse me. So, we'll see. And I brought up the, 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 um, the quarterback, the situation with the right quarterback. Well, I take that bet, actually, because, you know, if you remember, in the Patriots, with the, with the, New, with the New England Patriots, they've, Tom Brady has been running that offense for the last couple years. But if you remember the 2008 season, Tom Brady got hurt. And Matt Castle ran the offense. They ran the offense with a homegrown, solid backup quarterback. And the Patriots that year went 11 and 5. Matt Castle passed for 3,693 yards, had 21 touchdowns to 11 picks, and had a completion percentage of 63.4. So, <laughs> if you're able to group, so with the right quarterback that Bill O'Brien can work with and that one that can learn the offense very well, because the offense is not easy to learn. Offense is very complicated. So, just with these numbers, and that's the thing about this. You have to look at the you have to look at these kind of numbers. Seeing how Matt Castle was able to step into the starting lineup and and put up these kind of numbers and win games as well. 11 and 5. You know, that alone right there should give should should give you should give you a reason to say, "Hmm, maybe there's a chance that if we get the if Bill O'Brien gets the guy that he likes and can 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 teach him, there's hope." You know, and so, and that leads me to, um, and so that leads me to the last point I want, the, the last thing I wanted to point out, and that is a rumor that I that I recently read, that I recently read um, a couple weeks ago, oh, excuse me, last week, 
it feels like a couple weeks ago. But this was something that I read on January 18th, where um, there were... There were there were some rumors going around about a blockbuster deal between the Texans and the Patriots. <laughs> talk about talk about talk about coincidence. You know there was a rumor going around that they wanted to um, the Texans were willing to give up their a second round pick for um, backup quarterback. Ryan Mallet. Let me repeat that again. The Houston Tech. There was a rumor. This is rumor. It's nothing confirmed. And from what I hear, they haven't. There haven't been any kind of follow up to this story. So this is just a rumor. But I just want you to think about what uh, about about the possibility. Because think about it. Because think about this. The Houston Texans. There were rumors going around that the Texans might be. Sent giving the, their second round pick to the New England Patriots in exchange for the six foot six pocket passer Ryan Mount, the former Arkansas quarterback. Now, I watched Ryan Mallet at Arkansas, he did some pretty cool, pretty good things for that program. And I watched him fling that football up and down, up and down the football field. He can throw it. He's he he's got he's got quite a bit of he's got quite an arm. And you know, New England drafted drafted Ryan Mallett in the third round in 2011. Bill O'Brien was there, so he is familiar. So O'Brien was on the on the Patriots staff when Ryan Mallett was drafted. So there's some familiarity there too. But he has not and that's the thing for the last couple of years because Tom Brady was there, he's been the back quarterback. The only thing that we have to go by are is preseason. Preseason and practices. That's all. But Bill but like I said, because of that Bill O'Brien has seen more than we have in practice. In, in in the practices in, in off seasons, he's seen more than we have. But I watched Ryan Mallett in college. If Bill O'Brien likes the guy, I say let's get him. Let's get a guy like him. He's six foot six. Got a heck of an arm right out of Arkansas. Led Arkansas to <laughs> Arkansas was legit when Ryan Mallett was the quarterback. So there's so if we end up get trading for a guy like him in free agency it makes you wonder are the Texans leaning toward getting a defensive player in the in first overall or not even using the first overall pick which is which is something which is what I have been on record saying they should do I have been on record saying that the Houston Texans should do one of two things in this draft either take Jadavian Clowney number 1 overall or trade down and get more picks. Jadavian Clowney is the only guy in this class that I believe is worthy, is worth the number one overall pick. I believe that. And I've yet to see what he does, you know, in the at the at the, at the Pro Bowl. I'm sorry, not the Pro, I'm sorry, not the Pro Bowl. The um, the NFL scouting combine, his pro day, that's what I meant to say, his pro day, his practices, his interviews, how a lot of how a lot of NFL people look at him, how scouts evaluate him. So, you know. But and, and again, Blake Bortles, you know, it's the one thing that I always say about this to and I need to and uh, as I wrap up this episode. It's the one thing I, I'm saying about this draft that might be that that worries me a little bit because with all the needs at quarterback from a, not just the Texans from but from a lot of teams in the NFL, you know, like the Browns, the Raiders, the Jaguars, um, I have a feeling a lot of these quarterbacks that are going to be entering the draft are going to be taken higher than they should. The same way a lot of people were saying E.J. Manuel 
was taken over Geno Smith. A lot of people thought Geno Smith was going to be the first quarterback taken. But the Buffalo Bills used their first pick, used their first, used their first round pick, and they get G and they get EJ Manuel, which was a shocker to a lot of people. I personally believe I personally believe a lot of these quarterbacks be, are getting overvalued because of the need. You know, um, a lot of people are saying uh, Blake Bortles, guys like Blake Bortles, Johnny Manziel, Teddy Bridgewater. Now, Teddy Bridgewater, I believe, is a first round pick, and he could he also is deserving of the number one overall pick. That's what I believe. He's a, po he's a good pocket passer, good mechanics, worked in a pro-style system his whole career at Louisville. Heck of a good person as well. So, so with all that being said, you know, let's get a tall guy at quarterback and see what Bill O'Brien can do with him. Maybe, um, you know, make some room, make some cap room. Let's, let's let's get rid of a couple players that we don't necessarily that's possibly um, hurting us cap wise, and try to bring in some pieces that fit Bill O'Brien. And um, and we'll see what what goes on from there. You know. So as I wrap up this episode, um, for those of you that are what, and so that's all that I have. Um, so that just about wraps this episode up. For those of you that are watching this video on YouTube, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe to this channel for more. Um, I'll have and if and to those that are listening to this on the talk on via talkshoe.com, your community is calling. The feel free to follow follow that uh, page as well. I'll have a link to the talk cast in the description below. So that you can so that you can go on there and listen to this ep this recorded episode along with um, past episodes that I did before I made the complete transition to YouTube. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode of Bulls on Parade Talk. Again, subscribe for more videos. This is Joshua Signs signing off.